Um, welcome to Write the Docs. Write the Docs is an international organization and it's a series of conferences and local meetups and the things we're all focusing on are related to software documentation. The audience to Write the Docs are called documentarians and a documentarian can come from any walk of life. It doesn't have to be a technical writer. You could be in QA, you could be in content, in marketing, in sales, it really doesn't matter. But if you're passionate about documentation, this is the place for you. So internationally, we have conferences in Prague, Portland, and Sydney. There are meetups on five continents, thousands of Slack members. And if you're not a member of the Slack channel, you should join. Um, I have the information in a later slide. There's a mailing list that you can join. Um, every year we do an annual salary survey. The, this year's was just released, so take a look for it. There's a job board if you're looking for a job. There's merchandise available on the Threadless store. And there are special interest groups that you can join. Locally here in Israel, we have about 400 members on our meetup page. We're going to be running regular meetups. We're present at both the Megacom and Write the Docs conferences. And we're going to be starting a manager's roundtable. Write the Docs has a strict code of conduct. We ask you to be friendly and welcoming, to be respectful, to be careful in the words that you choose. And if you believe that someone is violating this code of conduct during any of our events, you may contact a member of the staff immediately through the link in the slide. And I'll supply it in the chat. In order to get involved and write the docs, there are many ways to do so. You can come to a meetup like you did today, um, either locally or internationally. There are, um, there's, there's a Slack channel that you can sign up to with thousands of different uh, channels within that that you can go into and ask questions. The YouTube channel contains recordings of all of our meetings and all of our conferences. Our next event is going to be on December 14th. The topic is certification and technical communication. And this event will be a panel discussion with representatives from organizations who are offering certification in technical writing. So today's speaker is Ruben Lerner. He is an internationally uh, known Python trainer offering classes through his company um, Learner Consulting. He created one of the first 100 websites in the world, is originally from New York and graduated from MIT. He's the author of several books, publications, and podcasts. I attached a link to his uh, website, uh, learner.co.il. You can go there for more information. And I'm going to stop my share and ask um, Ruben, I'm going to ask you to unmute. And you can begin. Oh, OK. Hello, everyone. Good evening, especially now that things are a little uh, calmer. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, I've been using Zoom for years, and this is the first time that I had such an experience. So um, yeah. <laughs> definitely a way to raise the adrenaline before starting a presentation. Um, so. Uh, it's really fun to be here, you know, here virtually. So as Laura said, I'm Ruben, and I am going to start with a small handful of slides, and then I'm going to be doing a whole bunch of live coding to sort of show you what I'm talking about. Um, and hopefully there'll be tons and tons of questions as well. So let me then share my screen, ba, 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 and then we'll do this, share, I guess the desktop, uh, and then we'll run this. Hopefully you can see my slides. Okay, if you don't see my slides, tell me. So very briefly, very, very briefly, Python, Python the programming language is really, really hot. And I should add, Python has been around for a long time. It's about 30 years now since Python came out and people are only kind of sort of now discovering it. Um, and you could say that's hotter than a whole lot of different things. It is hotter than JavaScript, C, C++, and C Sharp. And I realize that software developers love to uh, show off how amazing their programming language is. 
like their choice of programming language and anyone else's choice is obviously inferior and terrible. However, however, I have data to back this up. And so the data that I'm gonna to use to back this up uh, is um, what's called the Tyobi, I actually don't know how to pronounce it, but the Tyobi index, which comes out about once a month and shows how often people are talking about different programming languages. And as of this month, as of October, 2021, Python has become more popular, more frequently discussed, searched for and so forth than a whole lot of other languages, C, Java, C++, C Sharp, Visual Basic, JavaScript, and so on and so forth. Um, by the way, I should add a little tidbit, which is Python, I think it was a year ago, was searched for on Google more often than Kim Kardashian. Now I should add, I have never searched for Kim Kardashian. So maybe I am more representative of the population at large uh, than I thought. However, however, it seems that Python is just crazy, crazy popular. And just a day or two ago, there was a new article that came out in a management journal saying that, you know what skill managers all really need to learn? They need to learn how to develop software in Python. And that's because Python is used in a huge variety of different places. It's the leading language in data science and machine learning. You can use it for web applications, for Internet of Things, for creating APIs and web services, for automated testing, for system administration, DevOps, for education. A huge number of universities teach Python now as their first programming language, which is part of the reason why it's so popular. Network administration, security, and even in finance, a whole bunch of um, financial institutions, including banks, are, believe it or not, moving away from Excel and toward Python. Now, why? Why is Python so hot? And it's a whole bunch of different things together. One thing is that it's easy to learn. Um, the phrase that's often used is that it has low floors and high ceilings, meaning that anyone can get to learn it. It's not that hard. Um, you can actually, within a, a few hours of learning Python, you can start using it for things, but it's not a toy language. It's not a simple language that you can do simple things and then you're sort of stuck. It's a real sophisticated programming language that can do really sophisticated things, both like in terms of computer science ideas and algorithms, and in terms of um, actual use in production. It's powerful, real world applications use Python day after day after day. I mean, the companies that sponsor the international Python conferences, PyCon, is, you have companies like Facebook and Google and Yelp, and um, you know, uh, it just goes on and on Pinterest, it goes on and on all these companies you and Microsoft. Actually, Microsoft now has a huge number of really great Python developers who are working to improve the, la uh, the language. You also have hundreds of thousands of libraries that you can just download and install doing all sorts of different things. And it's also, as, as you, know, you might know, an open source language. Now, when people hear open source, they're like, aha, it's free of charge. That's why it's so great. And that is great. Um, I have some clients who come to me for training um, because they're moving away from MATLAB. And one of the reasons they're moving from MATLAB to Python is because MATLAB costs thousands of dollars a seed and Python costs zero per seed. But it's also open source sort of in the truer sense, which is that it's run by the community for the community. That is to say, the people who decide what will be in Python are the people who use it. And so um, it's not a company saying, well, we really want to meet our uh, goal, our sales goals, or we've got to do the hottest thing uh, that everyone else is talking about. It's really a, a sort of considered decision-making process of what do we want to be in the language? And it's okay for people in the Python community to say, that is really stupid. Whereas typically, if you get up and you say, what my company makes is really stupid, um, is not a great boost to your career. So enough talking about Python. Let's code some Python. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use what's known as the Jupyter Notebook. Now I'm gonna do what's called live coding here. Um, you know, and I'm gonna be typing as I speak. Basically what I've got here is what's known as the Jupyter Notebook, as I said, so we can uh, it's here, you know, Jupyter Notebook. And notice it's PY in the middle, not PI. That's because it's written in Python, pretty clever, huh? And you can actually follow along in close to real time with what I'm doing in the Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook. Um, you can also see it afterwards, but I put it on my GitHub and so basically every uh, minute or two, it's gonna sync with what I've got on my computer. And that'll be available both now as I'm doing this and later on. Let me see if I can put it in the chat. Uh, maybe, yes, <laughs> I can put things in the chat folks. So if you want to follow along live with what I'm doing here, you can do that. If you wanna look at it later on, that's also okay. So what I wanna show you here is some of the basic elements of Python that you should sort of be able to identify and understand um, as people coming to it from the perspective of people writing documentation, uh, documenting APIs, and just sort of trying to get into it. 
I will add that I am going to try to show you some of the features of Python that will make you say, or at least I hope so, wow, this is not so hard. I could actually do this because you know what? You could actually do this. You can 100% program Python. People do it all the time. And not saying that you, know, you can do it within 10 minutes and it's like anything takes time to really get going great, but I promise you can do it. I even have, if you're ever interested, I have a, um, a course called Python for non programmers, which is a 15 hour course that I ran last year uh, to be the pandemic. Basically, it was a once in a, once a week hour long course. So they're 15 hours total. You're welcome to take it it's totally free of charge. Thousands of people have. And uh, I think it's lots of fun. I mean, you know, of course, the best is lots of fun because like I get to laugh at my own jokes. Anyway, let's talk about Jupiter here is a great because the illusion is so great that I can actually use it here. So I can say something like print hello world and it runs the Python code. I can do more exciting things. Like I can say X equals 10 and Y equals 20. I can say print, you know, I'll do something like this. I'll do get fancy X plus Y equals X plus Y. But I can do more sophisticated things than that as well. And I will be doing that in the next little bit. Jupiter is not a toy. Jupiter is not just used as instruction. Jupiter is one of the key tools that people use in the data science world. Because what they end up having is what they call a living document. It's a document in which they can mix, as you see here, I've got markdown for documentation and for writing things. You've got code in the middle. You can mix it up, mix and match as much as you want. But the document then lives on a server that if you have it in your company, multiple people can go and look at it and edit it and play with it. And also in the data science world, rerun the models and test them and try them out. So Jupyter is incredibly popular. I used to tell people that on GitHub, there are 1 million publicly available Jupyter notebooks. And it turns out that I was wrong because there are 10 million publicly available Jupyter notebooks on GitHub. And that's the publicly available ones on GitHub. Imagine how many millions there are privately in various places around the world. So, okay, so let's say I wanna like do something with Python. So I'm gonna to want to maybe assign some variables, some values. Okay, well, variables in programming are sort of like pronouns. They describe a value. So what I'm saying here is that X gets the value 10 and Y gets the value 20. And I'm gonna print it out. And here's like a fancy way of me putting stuff in between. But let's say I wanna to explain to people what I've done. Let's say, and I know this is gonna sound crazy. I actually want to document what I've done. So there are ways for me to do that in Python. And what I can use is I can use comments and comments start with hash marks and go to the end of the line, just like this, right? And that works really great. Now, what if I have a multi-line comment, right? I have a comment here that is so brilliant and so long that it goes on for several lines. Well, now I want to, and I'll say X equals 100 after that, so I can justify it. How can I put this code in comments? It's very simple. I put hash marks before each line, which people from other programming languages say, that's ridiculous. Shouldn't you have a beginning comment and an end comment symbol? And the answer is no, but I do have cool things like this. I can highlight it and then just say, oh, I want to comment it. And then it's done there automatically for me. So I don't really have to worry about it so much. There is another way to do it that people also do. So if I were to like remove the comments from here, they will also use what are known as triple quoted strings, meaning three times in a row, I'm gonna use typically double quotes, but you can use single quotes as well. So triple quoted strings, officially speaking, aren't for multi-line comments, but lots of people do it anyway. And I think that's bad, but no one asked me. So basically, you can do this, and people do this all the time. And when you then run your Python code, this text string, this data is going to be thrown away because no one's really grabbing and no one's really doing anything with it. So these are two of the different ways that people have longer comments. I'm going to show you one more thing in a little bit, what we call doc strings. I will add, though, I will add that comments, comments are meant for the people modifying the code. They're meant for the people maintaining the code. They are not meant for the end user. They're not meant for the person who is going to be, say, calling the function, calling the API. It's sort of like the distinction between the owner's manual for a car and the mechanic's manual for a car. The comments are like the mechanic's manual. How are things implemented? What's going on behind the scenes? And in 
general, these comments are really supposed to be sort of technical and why did I do it in this way? Why did I use quick sort instead of merge sort? Right, something that someone who's going to actually fix the function is gonna to need to know and people who are gonna be using the function don't need to know. That said, plenty of people use comments poorly, write comments poorly, or even don't write comments at all. By the way, there is a movement of programmers who say that if you write comments, that's a bad thing. Because if you write comments, that means that your code was not written clearly and you're using it as a crutch. There are also people who point out that if you comment your code really well and you write your code really well, the code will change almost certainly. And will you remember to update your comments? Of course you won't. And then you have a mismatch, which is confusing to the next developer who's gonna come in and try to fix things. Or otherwise known in the trade as job security, otherwise known in the trade of consultants as a business opportunity. Okay, so we've got some basic Python going on here, but let's try to make it a little more interesting so you can sort of see what the structure of the language is like. And by the way, I'll add some of you who've seen some other programming languages before, and now I can officially say, backed up by statistics, inferior programming languages, they have a semicolon at the end of a line. All right, and so basically you'll see here, that's not true in Python. In Python, the end of the line is the end of whatever we're writing. And so you can't really have multi-line things except in certain circumstances, but generally speaking, one line per statement, one line for expression, and that's to try to make the code as readable as possible. And Python really prides itself on being as readable as possible. Um, sometimes pro people learning computer science learn what's called pseudocode. It doesn't really execute, but you can sort of understand what it's talking about in terms of a, a, an algorithm or some sort of functionality there. Um, and the thing is, Python has been called pseudocode you can actually execute. So let me give you an example here. So I'm gonna say name equals input, enter your name. And then I'm gonna say here, if name equals equals Ruben, print, hello boss, print, I really missed you. And I can say else, print, hello, you know, let's see here, hello, name. Now I can run this, but even before I run this, I think you'll have a good sense of what's going on, right? I am going to enter some input into the program here. Input is a function, a verb, if you will, that asks the user to enter something. In this case, it's gonna ask me to enter my name. And whatever I enter is gonna be assigned then to the variable name. And then it's gonna make a decision, right? The key thing in all of computer science is decision-making. Should it be this or should it be that? So if the name is equal to Reuben, and here we're using a double equal sign, which means I'm gonna check if the two things are the same. If it's Reuben, then it's gonna give me some you know, snarky comment here. And if not, then it's gonna say hello to the person. So if I say here, Reuben, let's spell my own name right. There we go. And if I say, oh, someone else, then it'll say hello, someone else. Now in many, many programming languages, the stuff here for the if or the stuff here for the else is going to be in what we call a block. And a block is going to be demarcated with often curly braces, sometimes in some languages, a beginning and end. Um, and there are no curly braces in Python. There is no begin end in Python. Instead, what do we use? We use indentation. All right. And we use indentation here to indicate where a block begins and a block ends. This causes no small amount of somewhere between angst and outright rebellion among software developers when they're told that indentation is the way that we indicate this. What is the programming language gonna tell me where to indent? And the answer is yes, yes it will. And the reason is that if you have curly braces, you're still gonna indent. And then you have two ways of doing it and you might get them mismatched. And so in this case, what you see is what the programming language sees. And so if you unindent it, well now it's outside of the if and it's always gonna execute. And if you do indent it, then it is there. By the way, what counts as indentation? Traditionally, we use four spaces. But if you are going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, you are doing it wrong because really your tools should be doing it for you. So I can, if name equal equal Reuven colon, I'm then gonna press enter. And you see Jupyter knew how to indent it there for me all by myself. All right, so I'm gonna run this again, blah, 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 whatever I enter. Here's one other thing that you might've noticed if you have any experience with another programming language. Where did I say that name is a string, a text variable? I didn't. That idea does not exist in Python. The notion that we have a variable that can only take a certain type of value simply does not exist. And that's because Python is a dynamic language, meaning that data has types, but variables don't have types. I do have typos, types. All right, so basically you could even say data have types. Okay, I know what audience I'm dealing with here. Um, basically, 
what we have then is we have like a data, we have string data, we have integer data, we have list data, we have all sorts of data, but any variable can contain any type at any time. Now, in the last few years, people coming to Python are working on larger and larger projects. It's no longer two people working on something themselves and maybe including a third if they really want to grow by a lot. It's dozens or hundreds of people working on projects and they're not sitting in the same room and they're not working with one another closely. And so this whole idea of, oh, it's a dynamic language. We're all friendly. We can all trust everyone. And if I don't know what I'm doing, I can just read the documentation or talk to the person in the next room. That's no longer true. And so in the last few years, something known as type annotations have grown in Python. Let's put it down here, actually. Watch this. So type annotation. So I can say x colon stir equals a, b, c, d, e. And this here, I've annotated x to be a string variable. And sure enough now, no problem. By the way, what if I say x equals five? Let's assign an integer value to this text string variable. You know what happens? Absolutely positively nothing. Python could not care less. Because at the end of the day, Python is still a dynamic language. So is it important if you see this kind of structure to document it? 100%, because that allows us to really sort of improve and increase the, shall we say, the strictness of our code. But it's not gonna be Python that does that enforcement. It's gonna be an outside program. One of, one of those popular ones is known as MyPy. And then it's gonna say, hey, wait a second, you're assigning an integer. You told me with this type int that you only wanted to get string variables there or string values there, I should say. So type annotations are new, but they're taking off pretty quickly in part because so many people are coming to Python from other languages where that was normal and natural and they kind of miss it, something I never expected. Okay, so we've got some like, you know, basic things going on here. What if I want to, um, you know, add some new functionality to the language? Can I do that? Yeah, absolutely. So adding functionality to Python is done with functions, right? Using a function. I can, I can define a new verb. So how do I do that? Well, I'm gonna say here def. Def is for defining a new function. I'll say def hello. I'll say def hello name. And then we say, oh, return hello name. What have I just done? I have I've taught Python a new word, not a noun, but a verb. And I can then call that function. I can use that function. So I can say, hello, proven. Oh, I forgot to use an F string. Uh -huh. There we go, much better. So what have I done here? I've returned, this just lets me sort of put a variable value inside of the curly braces. Oops, didn't mean that. Um, so that's very nice and everything. Uh, but remember I said that Python is a dynamic language. So I can say, hello, five, or hello, the list 10, 20, 30. I can even say, hello, hello. And here I'm gonna pass the function to itself as a value. And yeah, that works just fine. Yes, Python's, uh, Python, functions are not just verbs, they're also nouns. And if this strikes you as totally wacky, it is, but it's also super, super useful that I can then write functions that I pass other functions to. And this turns out to be an incredibly powerful technique that is not available easily in many other programming languages. When people, when programmers see this, they're like, oh wait, this is not a toy language, to which I say, I've been trying to tell you that for a while. Now it's time to finally listen. Huh? So basically you can do all sorts of cool things with functions. The thing is, how do I document this function? How do I tell the world what this function, not only what it does, but sort of what it does in a more formal way. I'm gonna to want to come up with sort of documentation string for it. And here I could do it in Jupyter, but I'm not gonna show it to you in Jupyter. Rather, I'm gonna show it to you in an actual editor for professional commercial Python code, something known as PyCharm. Now, can you, what, what editors can you use to write Python code? The answer is whatever you want. People in the same company can be using different editors. There's nothing wrong with that. Python could not care less. As long as you have a file that ends with a .py suffix, Python's happy. So it's unlike the, say, the .NET world where everyone must use the same editor. Python developers, like an open source, tend to be very um, personal, political, hostile, to certain ideas about which editors they can and should use. PyCharm is extremely popular. Another popular one is VS Code. Both are totally free. So I'm gonna create a new file now. So create new, and I'm gonna call here myprog.py. There we go. And then I'm gonna paste in my function hello, and then I'm gonna say print hello. Excellent, so I now have a function, and I now have a call of that function. And if I want to, I can even here reformat the file. And this is great. 
and I can even run it from within PyCharm, which is kind of great. And what do you know? It runs it and it says, hello, Ruben. What a great program. I think we can agree that we are well on our way to an IPO with this sophistication of software. The thing is, what if I'm not, what if like, I wanna understand it? Well, I can in PyCharm hover over the name and it's gonna give me all the documentation for it, which is of course, nothing. Why is there no documentation? Well, because I haven't written it yet. <laughs> so the way that we write documentation, and this is distinct from comments. So comments are for the developers and maintainers, but API documentation is for the people who will call the function or use the function. And we write API documentation in Python in doc strings, meaning if a string text is the first line of a function, that's the doc. So watch this, I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna say, this is the most amazing function ever written. So great, it gets a two line doc script. Fantastic. Now I've provided useful documentation for all my users. And if I go down here and hover over hello, look at that. We can see there down in the second, the latter part of the window, what it's doing. Now, this is clearly nonsense in a whole bunch of different ways. First of all, the definition is like three lines above the use of the function. So if you're not like able to understand what's going on there, something, yeah, there's a problem. Typically, doc strings are especially useful in this kind of way in hovering if um, you know, I'm using a function from another file. But it's also nonsense because clearly this is like the worst doc string ever written. Maybe it's the best function ever written, but it's the worst doc string ever written. And why is it terrible? Well, my software engineering professor back in college explained to us that every doc string should have, or every documentation, API doc should have three things. What does it expect? What does it modify? And what does it return? We can say returns with add access here. And maybe a little headline there. So, you know, a friendly function for anyone wanting a friendly reading. And so it expects to get a, a string assigned to name, modifies nothing at all. And it returns a string with you know, a friendly greeting. If you're documenting your functions in this way, I think that people will be extremely, extremely appreciative. Um, obviously having uh, examples as well, certainly super good. And now if I go and I hover over hello, well, look at that. Now I've got like, you know, quite the documentation here. Now I feel like I can say hello with, with uh, you know, uh, pizzazz. All right, so that's kind of nice, but wait a second, wait a second. We're not just writing functions. Nowadays, we're collecting our functions into objects. And what are objects? What is object-oriented programming all about? Object-oriented programming is all about restructuring your code so that it sort of fits together better, so that you have the nouns and the verbs together. So here I'm gonna uh, create one of my favorite examples from my uh, books and things. I'm gonna create uh, a set of classes, a set of new objects on one of the most important subjects known to mankind, ice cream. That's right. So I'm gonna create some classes to be able to deal with ice cream. And so I can say class scoop. And I'm gonna say your def, and I'm gonna describe this in a moment, self flavor. We'll say self flavor equals flavor. And then I can say here, well, and then I can say, we'll just start this way. S1 equals a scoop of chocolate and S2 equals a scoop of vanilla. Say print S1 dot flavor, print S2 dot flavor. What have I done here? What I've done here is I've created a new file. And this new file, this new file is a module, a file containing Python code that others can also use. This is also known in other languages as a library. And what have I defined inside of it? I've defined a new class, a new type of data that I can then create new instances of. So I can create as many scoops as I want. So I have one scoop of chocolate and one scoop of vanilla. And what I've done here is, this is what's known as the initializer. So here we set the, what are known as attributes of, so basically I create a new scoop of chocolate and I create a new scoop of vanilla and I can say, hey, what's your flavor? What's your flavor? Not surprisingly, when I run this thing, it's gonna print chocolate and vanilla. Very exciting. Can I do this from outside of icecream.py? Of course I can. I can go to myprog.py and I can say here, you know what I wanna do? I wanna import ice cream. And now 
what I can do is because I've imported ice cream, because I've gotten that, now I can say S1 equals ice cream dot scoop of let's say chocolate. What have I done here? I've said, hey, I wanna go into that ice cream module. I wanna grab the class scoop, the new data type that's there. And I want to create a new one. And then I can say print S1 of flavor. And that's gonna work just as if I were there. Here we go, and print chocolate. That's pretty great. So basically a lot of Python is actually not written to be executed right away. It's written so that we can execute it later on. But wait a second, if you were paying really close attention and probably you weren't because you didn't know what to look for, you'll see here that says chocolate, vanilla, hello, Ruben chocolate. Where did I do that? I didn't do that anywhere in here. Uh, but it turns out when I import ice cream, it actually executes the file from start to finish. So yeah, I got the definition of this class, but I also got all this stuff. That's where a special line, which you will undoubtedly see in Python code comes into play. I can say here, if name equals equals main. Now I'm not gonna go through all the magic here unless you really, really insist. But basically what this means is only execute this stuff if we're running ice cream.py as a program. Ignore below this line if we import it as a module. And that allows us to have what I call a two-faced module, that it's both a program we execute and it has stuff that we can define. I'm gonna show you one or two more things and then I think we'll be ready for some questions. Although like I could talk about this forever. So, you know, you might have to like pull me out of here with a cane and a, and, you know, and a gong. All right. So basically let's say now that I wanna have another class. So I'm gonna create class bowl, def in it. I'm gonna set here, so. I'm going to say here self dot bowl uh, self dot scoops equals a list, and then I'm going to say here def uh, let's say flavors. Well, let's do def uh, I don't know add scoop. Well, just add scoop. Right, we'll just do this. Self scoops append one scoop. Now, what am I doing here? I've just created another data type bowl, and it will allow us to take will hold as many scoops as we want, and then I have a method here add scoop. And then it takes one scoop and it adds it. Pretty good. So what I can do here is I can say, I can say B equals a bowl. Oops, bowl. B add scoop S1, B add scoop S2. And now if I run this, that's great, except for one little thing. I'd like to see what's in my bowl. Yeah, that would be kind of nice. Like I want to know if I'm, you know, what, what I'm eating. Generally a good idea. So what I can do is I can write more methods. And what happens in a class is that you get more and more methods. But wait a second, should we be documenting those? Aha, turns out that you can document a module with a doc string. Let's do that, right? And I'm gonna call this the ice cream module. Contains classes all about ice cream. Well known to be nature's perfect food. But that's not all. I can also say in my class, I can document, I can say, uh, you know, models one scoop of ice cream with a flavor. And then I can say the bowl here is, you know, models a bowl of ice cream in which the scoops are, you know, scoops are stored in a list known as self.scoops. You can get as detailed as you want in here. The cool thing is now, that I have all this stuff, and I can of course put in doc strings here. So I can say, you know, adds one scoop to our bowl. With this in place, I'm just gonna like grab these and put them in my other file here. So I'm gonna say here, it's gonna be ice cream dot bowl because we're using it from the module there. So now that I do that, look what happens when I hover. It's gonna give me the doc string. And when I say add scoop, it's going to give me the doc string. So I have this documentation available to me wherever I happen to be. And by the way, the module, if I hover over here, there we go. Look at that. It contains my module doc string. So these doc strings are pulled up by all these different tools in many ways. One last thing now. Um, what if, what if I have my bowl here and we can add a scoop to it and we can initialize it? but I want to have a secret, secret method, right? Everyone has private APIs. And you might've noticed, those of you who know anything about object-oriented programming, you've read, heaven for fan, you know, Java or C-sharp code or something. And you've seen they sometimes mark it as private or public or protected. And you'll see that I haven't done that with anything in Python. That's because those terms 
don't exist. Everything is public in Python. Everyone from everywhere can see everything, can change everything. We're a very like open group in the Python world. The problem is that sometimes you do want to say, hey, don't touch this, right? Uh, so what if I had, and you know, this is going to make children cry, but what if I had clear, let's, let's like empty bowl. So, so I'm going to create a new method that's going to empty the bowl of all scoops. I can hear them wailing already. Anyway, so I could write that method. I can say here, self.scoops equals empty list. Bam, all the scoops are gone. But maybe we don't want the general public to know about this method. Maybe this should really be a private method. How do I do that? How do I mark something as private in Python? Oh, it's so simple. I put an underscore before it. And if you put an underscore before something, the entire Python world knows, oh, that's private. Now, will they actually follow that? Programmers are going to follow rules, please. But in theory, in theory, they will follow them. They won't use it. And if and when you change your API in the next version, they can't complain. I mean, they can and they will, but they shouldn't complain. So private methods are demarked, you know, demarked by or you know, are marked by with a leading special methods and functions and even data in Python that is known to, um, you know, uh, shall we say, be a part of internal protocols, get double under, I would say double underscore before and after the word known in Python as dunder. So this method is known as dunder in it. I kid you not. I also kid you not when I say that I first learned this from a YouTube video when I was watching a talk from a conference. I was like, okay, did I just mishear that? And I discovered that I just had no idea how to pronounce this for many years because that's what happens when you learn from books. Um, there is much, much more that I'm sure I could say. Uh, oh, let me, let me just show off one, one cool thing here. Watch this. This is like, why do people love Jupiter so much? So I told you that Jupiter is used by the data science world a lot. So I'm gonna say import, uh, I'm gonna say PyLab inline. I'm gonna say import pandas as PD. And I'm gonna say from pandas import series. Yeah, I'm just gonna do that. So basically pandas is a library that's sort of like what I described earlier. It's sort of like Excel inside of Python. So I can create two dimensional tables if I really, really want to. I can also just create a series, which is a one dimensional thing. So I can say S equals a series of let's call it just 10, 20, 30, 20, 30, 40, 40, 50, 60. And we'll say here, the index is gonna be, and I'll say here it's Jan, Feb, Mark, April, two, four, six, eight, nine. So May, June. July, August, September, split. Great. I now have, whoa, why is it taking so long? That's not, oh, there we go. I now have all these numbers. I can then say s.plot.line, bam, right there in my notebook alongside everything else. And this is one of the reasons why data scientists are so excited about the combination of Python and Jupyter, because they can basically read data in, they can plot it in line here, they can make it available to other people on their staffs. And I even know of people who use these Jupyter notebooks for like almost a GUI for their teams, not of programmers, but of people to be able to sort of mess around with limited sorts of things. So this is one of like, from my perspective, one of those like jaw dropping things that Jupyter can do because you can really play with all sorts of data in all sorts of ways. Anyway, anyway, I hope there are lots of questions uh, and I'm happy to answer them. And by the way, like if there are no questions, I can, as I said, I can just keep going forever. I think everyone's muted, so they should be uh, posting oh. in chat. They can't <laughs> unmute themselves now. <laughs> why, why would we ever do that? I, you know, that I didn't have a good reason for it. So I'll, I'll, I'll add, by the way, like just sort of uh, while people are, uh, um, you know, are thinking about great questions to ask. Um, so Python is, as I said, an open source project and it's run by what's called the Python Software Foundation. So there's a nonprofit based in the US um, that has elections and everything, and they sort of run all the infrastructure. Um, they make sure that it remains open source. They make sure like they do some fundraising uh, from advertisers so they can pay developers to work on certain projects that are important to the community. Um, and they now have a new version of Python coming out every autumn. So every fall in October, a new one just came out literally a week ago. Um, and so the idea is that by having annual releases, 
they will be smaller. It used to be like every 18 months or two years. And that meant that it was big and companies needed to upgrade. And now they're saying, you know what? If you miss this year's, that's okay. There's always next year because each upgrade is kind of small. So the version is going to start to accelerate uh, beyond what it was before, but, um, but it's still like easy to get into. Done silence on the question front, folks, huh? Um, I, I actually, I have, I have a question. Um, Excellent. It, it's less about Python. I'm, I'm wondering if you know of something like Jupyter Notebooks, but for other languages. I've only ever seen it for Python, and I don't even know what it's called to Google it for something else. So, excellent, you should ask. So, the original name of Jupyter was the IPython Notebook. Um, mm -hmm. IPython standing for Interactive Python, not I am really jealous of all the attention Apple products are getting. And then they decided to change it to Jupyter because it turns out that IPython Notebook can be used with about 50 different programming languages. And Jupyter itself can be used with many different programming languages. You just need to get what's known as like the correct back end for it. And if you go to jupyter.org, they get millions of dollars in funding now from the EU and from Microsoft and from elsewhere. Um, I'm trying to see like where it lists what programming languages. Uh, dozens of programming languages. That's super specific. All right. Uh, <laughs> Language of 40 programming languages. Okay, including Python, R, Julian, Scala. Better, better. In any event, um, so if you want to use um, Jupyter, like the equivalent with another language, um, then, then it would be Jupyter. I'll, I'll tell you, by the way, that I've never used it with any other language. Um, I know, like, back when I was doing a lot of Ruby stuff, I tried it with Ruby and it was terrible, but that was like 10 years ago. Oh, oh, here we go. We have some questions. Excellent. We, so, yeah, we got questions. I don't know if you saw. Yeah, yeah, I just thought, okay, so, there, so Susan asked. So there was oh, a sorry. comment, by the Sorry. way, that uh, in regards to Jupyter, um, Bill mentions he uses it with Java and CFML. Oh, well, I'll, we all have our issues. No, 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 it's good, it's good. <laughs> I'll speak slowly for the Java programmers out there. Um, <laughs> this is like, don't take me seriously on this stuff, really, please. All right, so uh, Susan asked, besides including expects modifies returns, are there other good practices for documenting code that would be good to know or things to avoid? So um, one good thing to note is if you know there will be breaking changes in the future, right? So things change, things change. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I should not be watching the chat clearly. Um, things change over time and we know that. And basically, um, it's, it's good to give people advance warning. And there are multiple ways to do that, but it's good in the documentation to say, no, this works, this will stop working in such and such a version. Like you're currently using version three, but you'll actually very good about doing that, saying we're gonna like deprecate things over time. Um, increasingly also, I think because people are increasingly sort of a, a sensitive to types, you might wanna say, like, really, be, really be specific about what types you're expecting. And I would say, um, uh, again, examples. Let me just show you in pandas, just as an example, since I loaded it up here. If I say like help on, oh, this is my favorite one, PD of read CSV, because pandas can read CSV files. Hope you're all sitting down. This is the function for read CSV and all of the arguments that it can take. Wow, right? It's just like crazy because there's so many different things you can do with CSV files. But they then say, okay, we're not gonna like throw you to the wolves with these, this parameter list. We're gonna go through each one of them and show what it can do and when you would want to use it. And then at the bottom, they have tons and tons and tons of examples. Oh, I guess here they don't in this particular function, they don't, but usually they have lots of examples um, of where you would, like, how would you use it? Um, so those are two things that come to mind right away, I'd say. Uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Brown says, as a dedicated technical writer with a bit of program experience, what is a sample scenario where using Python will help me and my team? Um, well, uh, aside from um, eternal happiness and riches. Um, so basically, look, first of all, um, sometimes it's just useful to sort of be in that headspace of development, right? Like even if the developers on your team are using a different language, um, knowing sort of some of the terminology they're using, and most of those are sort of the same across different languages. If you can sort of speak to them about classes, objects, functions, data types, it doesn't necessarily need to be the same language for you to sort of get more of what they're doing. And this is probably like an easier, cheaper way to get into that headspace. But if you're talking in terms of like practical stuff, what you could use it for. Um, if you are like 
going through your files, your directories and doing things on them, you can probably with just a handful of days or even less of experience and training, start to be like, oh, I wanna go through these files and like read through them and do something. Here, I'll just give you like a, a, you know, an example. Right? If I want to like go through a file line by line, I can say for one line in open Etsy password. This is like my favorite punching bag. It's the Unix and Linux uh, um, uh, like list of users. And they print one line. Okay, so like I've gone through it and I've printed all the lines out here. But what if I want to like find all the lines that have something or extract information from there? So I can do that. I can say, let's say, you know, let's find, let's find all of the usernames in Etsy password. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, for all one line, well, I have to get rid of those comments. So if one line starts with hash mark, actually, if not, one line starts with the hash mark, then I'll print the line. Okay, so we've gotten rid of those pesky comments now. Now I've just got regular lines. And what you might not know, well, you probably don't know, like unless you're a super Unix nerd, is that this line represents one user and everything before the colon is the username. So what I can do is I can just say one line, split it across the colon. Now I've got a list of text strings and I'll grab index zero from there, bam. So if you're ever dealing with text file, then it's hard to beat something like this. And you can obviously mix and match what lines do you and don't you want? What do you wanna do with a line? And while this might seem like an incantation of sorts, I mean, I guess it is in some sense, but basically you should be able to, without too much trouble, um, you know, put these sorts of things together and think, get things from log files, configuration files, even programming files, because files are just text. And you can sort of pull out all the function definitions from somewhere. All right. Uh, DRC at 360 asks, uh, one question, how would you recommend document a function that's more than one argument? Oh, perfect. It's like in Israel, we have lots of arguments. So what if I say here, def, add of a and b and i say return a plus b so now i have a function with more than one argument right and by the way technically and this is like a super super pedantic thing but probably people get upset with you if you don't get it pedantically right these are called parameters the variables are parameters the values that are passed to them are arguments and i'm guessing like 90 percent of programmers will not be able to tell you that but that other 10 percent will really like hang you for not knowing that so there you go so how would i document this well i could say something like you know, adds two numbers. I would say like expects, um, you know, two numbers and we say integers, integers or floats, right? And then, you know, modifies nothing and returns an integer or float, something like that. So you can say this, and if you want to be more specific, because we've got this triple quoted string, we can go down multiple lines. We can be more specific. I say A, you know, integer or float and B, int or float. You can even say here something like, you know, uh, well, I mean, you could add more arguments and do it like that, right? And then I can say, I don't you know, five and 10, and shockingly, it will actually add them together. Um, okay, I've reached the end of the questions that were entered, so you still have a chance maybe if you have things you're dying to know. Oh, here we go. Avi asks, when comments are added to the code, is that for other programmers to understand their code or are they written for technical writers? Theoretically, theoretically speaking, comments are made for the other developers to understand why certain technical decisions were made. Um, and, and a longstanding rule in the world of documentation is you don't want to say what, you want to say why. So like, it would be really stupid and bad for me to say here, you know, retur you know return the sum of the two numbers, you know, A and B. Like all I've done now is restated that. That is helping no one. And one of these days that will indeed get out of date. But what I can do here is I can say, you know, this uses, I mean, I really, okay, commenting this would be kind of silly anyway, but right, but maybe I want to say why, what I'm doing there sort of at a deeper level. But yeah, at the end of the day, the comments are really meant for the people who are gonna be modifying the code. Now, now one of my favorite sayings, as I said before, in theory, Right, that's the way it's supposed to work. Well, my favorite sayings is, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. And in practice, I'm sure that there are many places where people are using comments as documentation for the API and are, and are like not limiting it to the developers. Um, I will give them a stern lecture at some point, but until then, uh, hold your tongue a bit. Anything else, folks? All right. 
Well, I hope this was useful and fun. Certainly fun for me. As you can tell, I really love what I do and like, get, get into this. Um, uh, Laura put all sorts of like information about me, where to reach me, whether it's on LinkedIn, whether it's on my website and so forth. I have my, I have my book, although it might be a little, little advanced for you folks, but it's got such a cute cover. Okay, it's a weird cover, but Manning puts people on their covers. and I was given a limited selection to choose from. Um, but if I can be of any help, also I'll put in a plug. If any of your companies use Python or think of using Python and you want me to come teach, I have like 25 different courses that I offer, everything from Python for non-programmers all the way up to advanced workshops. And I'd be happy to uh, come by and teach you guys. And I can teach also in a Hebrew, same accent, but I can do that as well. Thank you so much, Ruben. Um, this was an amazing session. Um, don't go anywhere, any, anybody. We have another session coming up right now. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, we'll get going. Okay. So my name is Laura Novich and I'm the technical publications manager at SillaDB. Uh, when I originally wrote this uh, presentation, that was true, but uh, I'm going to be stepping down from this role at the end of this week. So this is basically my last presentation as um, someone from SillaDB. But um, that said, I need, wanted to explain to you what Scylla is and how, what our approach is to documentation and how we use a Python uh, documentation tool chain. So SillaDB is a NoSQL database um, startup company. It was founded in 2014 by Avi Kaviti and Dora Laor, the two developers who created KVM. There are customers and employees all over the world thousands of products and drivers and solutions that are available for you to look at on the website. Um, they are striving to make the most monstrous database possible. And Project Circe is uh, the marketing campaign that dictate that has monthly releases telling you what's going on with the database itself. And like I said before, we are hiring a senior technical writer. Um, if you want to apply for that position, just let me know. So there are several components to Scylla Docs. And before we get into what the components are, I just wanted to explain very quickly what is Scylla Docs and what it looks like and how it behaves. So Scylla Docs is a mix of open and closed source projects all in GitHub. We use a docs as code philosophy where our documentation is in the same repository as the code. We call it docs and tree. It uses a modern tool chain, has automated testing. It's published on our website using um, GitHub uh, pages. Edits can be made directly on any open source uh, code page. There's a contribu uh, contribution button that you can click, click edit this page, and you'll be able to edit those pages. The Scylla docs is maintained by the product team. And contributors include SILA developers, uh, solutions, and volunteer contributors. So our decision to have our docs in code was basically a decision because we wanted to make sure that developers would see the code in front of them. And also, sorry, see the documentation in front of them along with the code. If it's there, chances are they will um, add information to it, and they will not finish their coding before they finish documenting. So what this does is it allows um, Scylla as an organization to elevate the level of documentation and make it important and to not accept any pull requests that don't have documentation that goes with it. Our workflow is that we will accept um, documentation either in restructured text or markdown. It's compiled with Sphinx. 
which will render um, HTML in a sandbox environment. It's pushed out to GitHub, where all the pull requests and commits are kept, deployed with GitHub pages. And if there are any issues, you can report them at the bottom of the page or at the top of the page, depending on which version you're looking at with the report an issue on this page. So for markup languages, we will accept uh, restructured text or markdown. There's differences between the two, but from the developer's point of view, they prefer markdown because it is less standard, um, more friendly and easier to work with. But you can also use restructured text, which develop, um, documenters will, uh, sorry, documentarians will appreciate because it is more standardized. It is fully featured. It has the ability to have um, Python directives and it's what we use at Celadocs. In order to um, write content, you can use almost anything. Um, any type of editor will, will do. Um, you can use PyCharm, which is what I'm using, um, Emacs, um, a Vim editor, whatever you like. It really doesn't matter. Sphinx takes your restructured text and markdown and renders it as beautifully designed HTML pages with, with the long, you know, as long as you have a CSS or a Sphinx theme. It has the ability to create um, direct, you can either have directives that you create yourself or it has uh, embedded directives that you can use which extend the functionality of the pay of your content and your display you can add extensions to sphinx which give you even more features and we use that for multi-version support to include a copy button or a custom theme We have a make file in our um, build, which allows you to run certain scripts. Um, make preview, for example, will allow you to view your HTML um, fully rendered as if it would, as if it would be um, launched on the World Wide Web, but in a local instance. Um, you can use different scripts to clean your temporary files. Uh, make clean does a simple cleaning, make pristine does something more uh, in depth. You can run link check, for example, to make sure you have no 404 errors. And we have um, an additional uh, script called make multi-version preview, which allows you to view multiple versions of your documentation based on software versions. So all of the beauty of Scylla uh, documentation is in the Sphinx theme. Um, the developer who has been helping me create this theme is here today. His name is David Garcia, and he can answer any uh, questions you have as well. Um, this project has uh, been, been, been in progress for quite some time now, and we are rolling out uh, version one of our theme over the next few days. Some of our sites have it, some of our sites do not, but within the next um, week or so, we should have the theme rolled out to all of our projects. The Scylla um, Sphinx theme is open source. It's available on GitHub, and you can use the link that we provided. It's fully documented, open sourced. Uh, any contribution is welcome. There's a contributor's guide and a contribute button that you can use in order to add changes to the theme. And any of the open source Scylla documentation projects as well. So when looking at how to produce your 
content, what we have done is we use GitHub Actions. And this does two things. Uh, first of all, it will create um, the publication. So it, it will run a job in order to build the um, version or the um, most current edition of the documentation. And GitHub Actions can also be used for checking contributions that are sent to the repository. So you can run a linter um, in order to check for spelling, to check for style. You can run uh, scripts to check for broken links. And you could also run a script to make sure that the, doc, um, that the build package for documentation actually builds. And then you can reject any pull request that doesn't meet the, that, those criteria. Okay, so let me just quickly give you an idea of what all this looks like. And hopefully I can change screens here. Okay. So can all of you see my screen still? Someone who yes. wasn't muted? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is the Sphinx theme. And this is the, our new design for the Sphinx theme. And as you can see here, it has multi-version support. We only have one version running right now. But if we were to add more, then this would be selectable with the list of versions that we have available. And it features um, several different items. We have a three pane screen, as you can see. And as you scroll down the page, the content will highlight to show you where you are. We have uh, you know, breadcrumbs at the top of the page. And there's a contribute button in order to either report an issue, edit the particular page, or learn how to contribute. And all of this, this theme has been propagated across all of our sites. We have 11 different um, documentation sites that we run for all of our projects. And we wanted to make sure they have the same look and feel in order to unify them and still allow the projects to exist on their own. Okay. So do we have any questions at this point? I tend to speak really quickly when I'm under the gun and I wanted to finish on time. So if there's something that is not clear or that you want um, yeah, there's to reiterate, one in chat. let me know. There's one in chat. It says, have you used any other SSGs besides Sphinx? And can you speak to what Sphinx does better than other options? OK, so when looking at a static site generator, I'm guessing that's what you mean by an SSG. Um, the only one I've used is Sphinx. I know that there's Hugo. Um, I can't really say much about it because I've never used it. And I know that there are other options out there, like many, many, many more. Um, but honestly, if, if we want to have a war of the static site generator as a topic for a meetup, I'm, I'm there. Um. If I can add to that, there's I'm going to post in chat. There's a really great website um, uh, that compares that basically gives a rundown of uh, of what the options are, what are the underlying um, uh, what are the underlying uh, technologies, and so on. And I just posted it. All right. Thank you, Shalom. Anybody have any other questions? Yes, there's another in chat. It says, if a company maintains its docs on a help authoring tool, such as Flare or Paligo, Paligo, is it a, quote, nightmare to migrate everything to a docs as code format? Um, well, let's put it this way. If you're using Flare, then you can also use Git as your repository for holding your content. Um, 
this is a pseudo doxis code type look at things. It doesn't it doesn't tick all the boxes, but you're kind of there. Um, what you're missing is you you're not going to get contributions from developers because they're not going to want to touch Flare. They're not going to want to touch it with a 10 foot pole unless you want to invest the time to um, train them and you're going to buy a license for them and you're going to expect that they're able to pick up, pick, pick up the tool. Um, that said, um, the transition from something like Flare or Polygo to um, restructured text or markdown, it could be a nightmare because the underlying uh, language of Flare, correct me if I'm wrong, is XML. So there's going to be some type of conversion you're going to have to do there. And it could be problematic, but it's a one-time thing. So the question is, are you going to make the investment to change your um, existing documentation? Or are you going to just say, OK, from now on, anything that's new is going to be um, you know, written in restructured text or markdown? The other th way to do it is you can say that, OK, our open source um, documentation and our open source product is going to be written on whatever the community wants. So if, the, if it's markdown, markdown, restructured text, restructured text. And all of our enterprise stuff is going to be done in uh, Flare or Polygo because you know this is what we want to use as a technical writing team. Um, just a couple comments on that from Janine. She says Flare is all XHTML, um, and it would definitely be an annoying transition. Jackie asks, what's the reason your different projects or products are in separate doc sites? Do your users potentially use more than one product? And if so, how do they find the information they need on multiple products? Okay, so from the docs portal or... Um... Oh, sorry, there's a second part to the question uh, or third part. Additionally, if you rely on things like auto link updates, conditional text, et cetera, you'll probably have to develop those features. Oh, just kidding, unconnected, ignore, ignore. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, at Sela Docs, we have, um, one, from the user's point of view, it's, it's ubiquitous. We have one site. Um, all of the content is present on docs.celadb.com. And unless you're paying attention to the address bar at the top, you're not going to realize that you're actually being directed to our different sites along the way as you dive deeper into the documentation. Why do we have everything separate? Um, we just simply made a decision to have our docs as code philosophy be in tree. So every repository has the docs right there inside the repository itself. Uh, the reason why we made that decision is because I'm a solo technical writer at Scylla. We have um, 75 developers developing. I can't keep up with all of them. And in order to make sure that the docs train doesn't stop, we made a decision to allow um, our developers, not just allow, to um, encourage our developers to write the documentation. And as such, we had to have tools that they would want to use, would like to use, and would be happy to use. So th this was our decision-making process. Oh, and by the way, um, if you want to learn more about it, um, take a look at the YouTube channel for Write the Docs. I gave a presentation back in March all about this um, called Documentation Communities. And my question was is whether or not it was a documentarian's gambit with a little wink to the Queen's gambit. Um, it's a presentation that you can find on the YouTube channel for Write the Docs. And if you want to hear exactly how we, we went through this process, feel free. And you can reach out to me afterwards. Um, yes, there are reusable variables and snippets. Um, basically, what we do is we have this lovely statement called include. And it allows you to take a block of anything. It could be a sentence, a word, or whatever. 
um, whatever is in that file just gets included across your project in multiple places. Um, project links, uh, there are a couple of ways to uh, manage them. The easiest way with restructured text is to use the directive called um, either doc or reference. Um, the reference uh, requires a anch an anchor, and that anchor could be referenced from anywhere within the Sela Docs domain. Did I hit all of the questions? Um, there's one above. Uh, yes, oh, sorry. So contributions or suggestions from the uh, public, do they improve Sela Docs? Well, this is the philosophy of open source. Do you want to allow the public to contribute to your documentation? Um, the, every company has a different um, way of doing it. Every company has a different experience with it. With Scylla, because we are somewhat new, we don't have too many contributors who come in from outside of the organization. So I really can't give a judgment call on it. But what I can say from my experience of working at Red Hat is yes, if, if you have a healthy community that actively contribute to documentation and code, it makes for a healthier product. Okay, um, are there any more questions? Um, I would like to just take this opportunity to thank uh, Reuven, Shalom and everyone who helped me uh, manage the chaos that ensued at the beginning of this uh, session. Um, lesson learned, never fly without a co-pilot. So that's not gonna happen next time. And um, we will come back in December with another meetup. Uh, stay tuned for um, more to come. The content that we're going to be talking about next time is uh, whether or not one should be certified in technical writing. So this is something that is up and coming and we wanna bring it to the, to the forefront and discuss it. And what I'm going to be doing is bringing um, people to present the different options you have for certification. I thank everyone for participating. Have a great night. I will follow up with a link for the recording as soon as we um, have it ready. Have a good night, everyone. Stay safe. Should we end the recording? Yes, we are.